Hello, everybody. My name is Ed Lynch. Welcome to SurfingBaseball.com. Um, we are on Instagram. We are on X, formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Spotify, and YouTube. You can find us in any of those uh, social media social media outlets. My special guest today is a former teammate, future Hall of Fame manager, Terry Francona. Um, managed many, many years, 23 seasons, if I'm correct, uh, Terry. Uh, four in Philadelphia, yeah. eight in Boston, 11 in Cleveland. How you doing today, Terry? Eddie, I'm doing good, man. It's good to see you. It's good to see your face. Good to hear your voice. Um, you know, we got through the hard part. We got through the technological part of getting <laughs> on here. Now it should be fun. Exactly. Okay, we're going to start at the top of the first inning. Why were you born in Aberdeen, South Dakota? Let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> it's actually a pretty cool story. Um, my dad was playing Class D ball. This was back, you know, 1959 when they just didn't have triple A, double A. You know, he was all the way back in D ball playing for the Aberdeen Pheasants. <laughs> His manager was a guy named Zeke Strange. And he he was married to my mother's sister. So my dad ended up meeting my mom there. Um, we lived there for about two off seasons. And my dad was playing then in Cleveland when I was born. And I think they just realized, you got to remember, this is 1959, 1960. Getting from Cleveland to Aberdeen wasn't exactly, you know, a, a, a nonstop flight. So we, they moved back to, to western Pennsylvania where my dad was raised. Yeah, I saw that you were a, a Pittsburgh guy and a uh, great sports town. We've all been there a hundred times. How did you wind up all the way across the country in Arizona? At the University yeah. of Arizona, you know, I got drafted. I got drafted by the Cubs. This will make you laugh. I got drafted by the Cubs in the second round. I think it was like the fourth pick of the second round. Out of high school? Yeah. And you didn't sign? Well, Eddie, they offered me eighteen thousand dollars, and I told uh, it was Terry Kennedy's dad, Bob yeah, Kennedy. Bob Kennedy, great man. And and I told him, I said, Bob, man, I got this scholarship at the University of Arizona. I said, God, man, can't you give me like forty thousand dollars? And they came back and offered me nineteen. So, <laughs> <laughs> you so drove a hard I, bargain. <laughs> I know. So you know, I, I I had I had a scholarship offered in North Carolina and one to Arizona, and I was sitting there and I kind of wanted to go to North Carolina. It was closer to home. Just really had a good visit. And I'm, I had the letter of intent sitting in front of me, and my mom was there. And my dad looked at me, and he said, you want to be a Major League Baseball player? And I said, yeah. And he goes, sign that. And it was to go play at Arizona. And, and, you're, still, and you're still there. <laughs> I'm still here. And you know what? It was it was the smartest thing. Uh, Jerry Kendall was, was the coach. Legendary I think, coach. I think my dad knew that he was the perfect guy to kind of keep – keep me under control. I was a typical 18 year old. I wanted to see and do everything. And, of course. and I learned to play baseball the right way. And, and like you said, I still, I live here now. It's my home. That's great stuff. And I saw you guys won the 1980 college world series. And, you know, I, I went to South Carolina out of high school to play basketball. We lost a championship game twice in Omaha in 75 and 77. So we came really close. Now, I was looking at the uh, – we lost Arizona State in 77, and we lost to Texas in 75. Arizona wasn't there either year. But I was looking at that 1980 World Series, and you guys go in there, and you lose your first game to St. John's, and I'm thinking, what? And then I looked at their roster, and I'm thinking, you saw Frank Viola come running out there and Fr John Franco closing it out or what? Yeah, we thought it was going to be a quick trip. I think he two hit us, and, and we didn't even sniff him. And – and then, you know, you don't remember how it was. You get in that loser's bracket, and it seems like you're playing a game about every 12 hours. Yeah, that's but right. it, it was it was fun. It's one of my best memories. You know, anytime you can jump on the pile at the end of a season, I don't care where you are. Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah, that's one pleasure I never had. So I'm glad you got to experience it. Then you get drafted uh, by the uh, Montreal Expos in the 1981 draft first round. 
and you come, uh, excuse me, 1980 draft, and then you come to the big leagues in the strike year. That was my rookie year, too. I came up in 80 for a little while. 81 was a weird year. You know, I, I got sent down out of spring training. I came back up. I got sent down the day before the strike. They wanted me to pitch. I pitched the entire strike in AAA. I come up to the big leagues the day it ended, that all-star game they had in Cleveland. And I come out for the second game of the second half. I'm pitching against Bill Madlock at Wrigley Field. I throw one of my below average heaters right down the middle, and he hits a rocket in the first base dugout. So the light bulb goes on. These guys haven't played in 58 days. So I just started throwing heaters low and away and low and away. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that 81 Expos team was pretty darn good. You had three Hall of Famers on it, Gary Carter, Andre, Andre Dawson. I played with both of those guys. And Tim Raines, I guess, who was a rookie that year. But also you had guys like Chris Spire, Larry Parrish, who was an animal, Tim Wallach, and then the, the pitchers, Steve Rogers, Bill Gullickson, Charlie Lee, my former teammate, who uh, later on, Frank Cashin said it was the worst trade he ever made. And I'm not disparaging anybody, but Jeff Reardon came over there and did a hell of a job for you guys. You had Woody Fryman, the late Scott Sanderson. So, I mean, that team was loaded. And I remember you guys clinched the second half title at Shea Stadium. And I was in the other dugout when that happened. And then you guys. Andy, got... I, don't, I don't think people realize how good a teams they had up there because, oh, you know, man. the Pirates and the Phillies were so good and the Cardinals. Yeah. But, man, they ran some talent through there, and it was they did a really good job. Plus, you had to deal with the city of Montreal, too. You know, there's nothing to do there. So, you know, the focus is that, on the that can, that, can shorten your, <laughs> that can shorten your career just by just by playing there. That It's a, man, it's a wonderful place. It's a too great good. city. The ballpark was a little bit of a challenge. You know, the, 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 that roof they designed to put the umbrella on the roof, it was stuck open the entire decade of the 80s when I was playing. Then it was stuck closed the entire decade of the 90s when I was in the front office. So, but you know, you're right. They put some great teams up there. You know, when it's your first team, you don't really realize maybe some of the some of the things that maybe you notice later in your career because it's your first team and it's kind of like family. But shoot, I remember, you know, you're talking about the roof. You know, hitters complain about shadows, and there oh. were about eight shadows there because of the way the roof was configured. And then they, you know, the 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 playing surface was like a piece of carpet put down on a piece of cement, so it was it was challenging. Most of those most of those stadiums were like those in those years. I remember standing shagging out in Three Rivers in Pittsburgh, and looking at those squares, those uh, plywood squares with turf stapled to them, and then they're laid in like pieces of a puzzle. And there were gaps between the pieces. And I'm sitting there thinking, if Jack Lambert grabs me and slam dumps my neck bone into that thing, I'm never going to walk again. No wonder those guys are so crippled nowadays, getting tackled on that stuff. Eddie, I don't know how they did it. I, I, it's funny. You, what you just said, I have said so many times. Can you imagine being a running back, coming around the end, and getting driven into that concrete you know, <laughs> on your shoulder or your collarbone? It, it's, it amazes me. It really does. And, uh, you know, I played with another guy. You've had some knee problems. I've got knee problems now. But, you know, I played with Andre Dawson, who had the single greatest uh, season any position player ever had that I played with, 1987 with the Cubs. He showed up the first day of spring training, didn't have a contract. It was the collusion years. We had the same agent, Dick Moss, and he's trying to get a con trying to get a contract. And he goes in and lays a blank contract, Dick Moss does, on – on Dallas Green's desk, and he fills in five hundred thousand. He goes out and plays for five hundred thousand. Wins the MVP of the league, and you know I think he wanted to come to us because of the grass and Wrigley Field because he got beat the shit in in Montreal all those years. You know what, Eddie? We used to stand on the training table same time every day. We'd get our knees taped the same way every day, and then he found a way to go out and be Andre Dawson. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't do it because people used to ask me like, Hey man, were you kind of bitter? And I'm like, no, I, I watched guys like Andre Dawson still find a way to be productive. I couldn't do that. And because of that, you know, I tried to find a way to maybe make myself valuable enough just to make a team. I mean, shoot, man, it, it you know, it got hard. I, I tell people I'm proud that I played 10 years 
But the last nine and a half, I was hanging on by a thread. <laughs> well, I played eight years, and I was hanging on by my fingernails the whole time. The it's only time I signed easy. a multi-year con- first time I signed a multi-year contract, I was a farm director. I signed a two-year deal with the Padres. <laughs> so, uh, walk us through when you when you decided your playing days were over. I don't know exactly what year that was, but you went home after. So, in October, you go home. I don't know if you went to winter ball. When did you decide that you've had enough as a player? And then what happened after that? So I, I played um, in Milwaukee and, and got released, which I don't, I don't blame them. I, you know, my goodness sakes. Um, I went to AAA with St. Louis and I wasn't healthy enough to play in the major leagues. So I go to Louisville and play on that turf every day in the outfield. <laughs> and when the season was over, I ended up having three surgeries. I had my knee reconstructed, I had my shoulder fixed, and I had my wrist fixed. And I remember Buddy Bell calling me because I had roomed with him in Cincinnati. And he said, are you ready to start coaching? And I said, you know, Buddy, I said, I had three surgeries and I worked so hard. I just want to see if I can do it. And he goes, okay, I, I get it. Well, I went to spring training with St. Louis and I couldn't do it. Yeah. And, and, and so when I came home, I put my stuff away and never looked back. And Buddy called me about six weeks later, and he goes, you're ready now. And I was actually taking a course at a night real estate <laughs> class. And I went up to the teacher, and I gave him my books. And I said, sir, nobody's going to buy a house for me. I go, give these to somebody. Yeah, well, let me tell you something, and, and this is a good lesson for young people, anybody really. I don't think you're ever going to reach the top of anything you do unless you have a passion to do it. I mean, if you're just going through the motions, you know, you're getting up in the morning, you go, oh, shit, I got to go try to sell houses. And I'm doing that now. I'm a realtor now, and I'm, you know, and I, I, I've got great partners and I've got a, somewhat of a passion for it. But when you do something as long as we've done it, I mean, I have a passion for this now that's huge because. I got 40 years. I got lots of friends and, and uh, you know, it's just a great game with, and, you know, uh, just happy to have been a part of it as a mediocre to below mediocre player like I was. So, so where did, where did buddy send you after six weeks? You go to the, to uh, the rookie league. It went down to Sarasota in the rookie league. And I was a hitting instructor that, that summer. And it was good because I, you know, the, I remember the first day out there wanting to work with this 18 year old kid and I went to talk to him and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know what I, you know, I didn't know how to say it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I got to learn and make mistakes and and without, you know, it being at a high level. And yeah. shoot, man, the, when you, you know, when you see kids that come out of high school and you're with them two weeks later, I mean, I'm still talking mean, those guys like Mike Cameron. Um, guys that I still talk to today. And then the next year I started managing, uh, Buddy sent me to South Bend. And then I was supposed to go to Sarasota the next year. And something happened right before spring training with the guy that was going to manage in Sarasota. And I don't know what happened. But so they had to send me to Birmingham because they didn't have time to hire anybody else. And it was probably the biggest break I ever got because we had a good team then. And then Michael Jordan comes the next year and you kind of get that experience. That's just luck of the draw. Well, you know, I didn't, I, I thought that Michael Jordan really made your bones a hundred percent. Like you got managed. I knew you had a manager of the year at Birmingham, but it was a year before he got there. Yes, exactly. You, know, so you had a good club and you, now you're starting to build a reputation. What was the first indication you were going to get the most famous athlete in the world playing a different sport for you? You know, he was in spring training in Sarasota with the big league club. And, you know, back then, man, the big leagues and the minor leagues, you didn't cohabitate. You know, you stayed no. on your side of the wall. That's right. And we used to have our 7 a.m. meeting out in the trailer. And I remember Larry Monroe said something about, well, Michael's going to be in the Birmingham work group. And my life changed the minute that door opened and we went outside. I was like, you know, I was probably a little hung over and tired and all of a sudden you know it's like everybody wants a piece of you and it I didn't know it because I was just trying to survive but it was the greatest learning experience you could ever have that's probably one of the few instances where a, a 10-year major league player who has managed 
is going to learn something from a, a, a recently signed player. Going to learn a lot from a guy. And you know, that Eddie, it was some kind of experience. It, it was a great experience. And what what made it work was Michael was so respectful of the game of baseball. That was one of the things I'd said to him was I said, hey, for this to work, you know, you, you got to respect. And I kind of explained to him about the other 24 guys and how much money they weren't making <laughs> and how many years they had played to get to double A. And he handled it so well that it just made it work. And, yeah. you know, I, I just, again, if you had a problem with him, I think it was maybe on you because he yeah. just, he treated the game. He loved playing the game. He, you know, he, you had to be patient because he didn't know a lot. Yeah. But oh, it was really? easy to be patient just because the way he acted. Yeah. Did he really buy you guys a bus? That's a little bit of a he so we uh <laughs> the first day in, in Sarasota, I you know, the day he got to our work group, I kind of washed and I saw everybody wanted to be his coach. You could just everybody. So I'm walking up to introduce myself and I can see him. He's like, Oh boy, here comes somebody else. And I said, Michael, I'm Terry. And I said, I'm going to be your manager. I said, Hey, why don't we just, why don't you just take the next four or five days, get a cut, get, get comfortable. When we get to Birmingham, we'll sit and talk. And you could just see him go like, Oh, thank goodness. You know? So when we got to Birmingham, I, you know, the first, one of the first things he asked me was he goes, Hey, did we fly? <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, Boy, I wish. Yeah. Yeah. And he, and so I kind of explained to him and, so he said, well, what if I could get us a better bus? And I, you know, I called the guys in Chicago and they're like, hey, just handle this. Well, that next day we have like four buses sitting out in the parking lot <laughs> and I get on the first one. And I remember, man, he's so proud. And it's like a, a bus for a for a music group. And I get on and I'm like, hey, this is a great bus, man, for me, you, and the three coaches, but what about the other 23 guys? Where are the other 25 guys gonna go. So we ended up getting we ended up getting a new bus. It looked like the Partridge family bus. <laughs> but the good part of it was it was new, so it didn't smell, it didn't break down as much as the old one did. But but the, the it wasn't even the best bus in the leg. Um that was and 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 I guess we rented it. He signed the door, and they called it the Jordan Cruiser, and the bus company made a killing. I bet. So I bet you're going into – say you're going into uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm sure you got a call ahead of time from their PR person. Hey, could Michael come out and sign autographs for, for three hours before the game every day? You know, I mean, I, I remember going through with Sammy Sosa in 1998 in the big leagues where you have more control, and people just know you just don't ask for certain things. So I'm sure you've got some weird and crazy uh, uh, requests. And did you, did you, did they bring you, did they send you a, a PR person to travel with you and stuff like that? No, we, we, I, they, we did one better. There's a guy named George Kohler who to this day, love the guy. In fact, I just talked to him about three days ago and he was Michael's guy. And, you know, you know your antenna goes up kind of early and I'm watching and, and they didn't want this guy to be on the field or in the dugout. But as I'm watching, he he had a way of, like, his antenna was always up. Yeah. But he was non-confrontational. And I remember thinking, this is going to work way better if he's around. So this guy's in the dugout and you don't even see him. <laughs> he was everywhere, yet he was never, he never cared about being, you know, he just was looking out for Michael. He had all his best. In, it, it worked great. I mean, he he put out anything, he, and he was like I said, non-confrontational. I mean, we loved him, and to this day, like I said, I talked to him three days ago. Um, he was oh, he, Michael he, brought him, Michael brought him with him. He and, went everywhere with him, and the, because and the White Sox shoe was fine with that. Ron Schuler, he's shoe was okay with it. I think shoe was like, hey, if I don't know. What I don't know won't hurt me. <laughs> That's right. You know, like, and she was awesome. He just said, handle it. And so I tried to do the best I could. You did a, you did a great job. But what was it like the first time he got his got jammed 
and and his thumbs are sore and he comes in and goes god damn i don't know if i can do this it doesn't look like this on tv <laughs> you know what and, and the guy i mean he wanted to hit all day really? i remember he used to you know used to say to him, michael you know your hands are bleeding like sometimes it's better just to maybe take a you know just take a little time and but he just wanted to hit and hit and hit i tell you what you know, because I went to the fall league with him that that fall, and he hit 250. And I'm not going to say that he knocked the ball all over the ballpark, but he did better than a lot of young prospects did. Yeah, and and he found a way to steal 30 bases. I mean, there were some things he could do, and I didn't think it was fair to 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 make an assessment on his career after 500 at bats. But I bet you, if you gave him a couple thousand at bats. He'd he'd have found a way to get his way to the big leagues because I found out real quick when you tell him no, he'll find a way to make the answer be yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he's a once in a generational athlete. Yep. I see he retired in March of the made it official. I saw in his bio he retired in March of the following year. Did he come to spring training in March? Or yeah, what did he say to you after his last at bat? You guys are shaking hands after the season. Did he say, "Hey, I'm done" or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Like, remember, we went to the fall league together. Oh, that's right. That's right. Pretty, Come on, after the fall league, he was pretty jazzed the way it it ended. I mean, he did pretty well, and he came to spring training. But now, if you remember, that was the lockout year. That's right. So now he comes, and and I don't know all the particulars. But I think he felt like he was getting put in a really difficult that was, position. That was my first year as GM. Okay, yeah, and that was a, you know, it's, it's hard you know, was, on everybody. Yeah, I was the league rep. I was a player rep for the the Mets when I was a young player, and I and I told Andy McPhail, my boss, and Andy was great about it. I said, "I'm not going to ask any of our young players to cross that line. I would never have crossed the picket line. Never. It was never going to happen." Did I hold it against these guys? No, not not none whatsoever. But to put Michael Jordan in that position where he's going to cross a major league strike picket line. So I guess he he just said that's it, I'm done. Well, no, he didn't just say that's it, but and again, um because I knew him, his his guy that helped him uh strength and conditioning, I think it was Tim Tim uh, I can't think of his last name now. He was coming down to Sarasota. And I remember just my antenna went up a little bit. And, oh. and I think this just kind of gave him the impetus to maybe gracefully go back to the NBA because yes. he couldn't be put in that position. No. And so I kind of, you know, again, it just, you could see it coming. Okay. So, uh, over the next couple of years, you managed in the minor leagues. And then what was your first major league coaching position? Um, when Buddy Bell took over the Detroit Tigers, that was two years later, he took me as his third base coach. Boy, that's and, that is and, and I've learned so much from Buddy about how I feel about the game. You know, we used to sit up at night when we were in Cincinnati and Buddy would sit at my table in my room. We had adjoining rooms. And I would know it was time to go to bed when Buddy would fall asleep and his cigarette would burn his lips. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned so much from him. And then when that's – and that was a bad team. Like, I think we lost 111 games. And I was driving home from Detroit to Tucson, and I had a message to call Randy Smith, who was the general manager. And I remember thinking, oh, man, I'm, I got fired already. <laughs> Can't even get back home. <laughs> and Smitty asked me, he goes, he goes, Tito, who do you know in Philadelphia? And I said, I don't think anybody. He said, well, they want to interview you. I said, for what? <laughs> and he, he said, I'm just telling you. So, you know, I talked to Buddy, and Buddy was like, hey, you know what? He goes, it'll be a really good learning experience for you. Shoot, about three weeks later, I was the manager. You know, like, isn't that something when, when you go into a place to interview when you want it desperately, it seems like you never get it. When you go in there figuring, I'm not going to get it, you're relaxed, you're yourself, and you got it. Lee Thomas was a general manager, and Ed Wade was the assistant general manager. And I remember Lee Thomas later telling me, he's like, you know, I came out to the fall league, and I didn't even remember this. And he goes, I came down on the field, and he goes, you got a ball sign for me. 
And I told him, I said, Lee, if I'd have known you're going to hire me, I'd have got you a bat and a glove too. <laughs> so he spent four years in Philadelphia, never really got over the hump there. Ooh. And I we didn't even get to the hump. I remember running into you. I had left the GM job and I was scouting and we were both standing in the lobby of the uh, Grand Hyatt in New York. It was coming down to last series of the year. And we all know when we're done, you know, we, with that organization, I asked you, I'm not going to use any names. You already talked about some of the name. I said, Hey, when's the last time you talked to the GM? He said, I haven't talked to him in a month. And I said, Oh, gee, that ain't a good sign. You know? And how, yeah. how long after that season, uh, did you get let go the next day? Bloody Monday. Actually, Ed Wade and he, and he there, there's no great way to, you know, I of mean, of but not. I will say this. He called, we were down in Florida the last day of the year on a Sunday, and he called me that morning to come up to his room. And like I said, there's probably no graceful way to do it, but I knew he was trying to be respectful. Yeah. I, I really, I knew that. I wasn't happy, but I knew that. He was trying to do it the best way he knew how. That's all you could ask for. Yeah. And to this day, I have a lot of respect for, for Ed. And I always have. And he, again, he there is no great way to do it. He just was trying to do his best. And I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I used to get that all the time. Uh, you know, when you're a farm director, you, you release more players than you'll ever dream about releasing as a GM. You fire more staff guys you'll ever dream about firing as a GM. And, and you know, when I had to let guys go, I tried to do it respectfully. And, and, you know, and then I'd hear they'd be saying, well, he didn't handle it well. You told me how to fire somebody well, and I'll do it. Give me the script, and I'll do it. There's no way you can do it. You know what, Eddie? You to let them know that you respect them. You know what? If you and call you know, them, you, you were supposed to do it in person. If you do it in person, you're supposed to call them. You know, I mean, you, like you say, you just try to be as respectful and caring as you can and honest. And I think there's a way to be honest without beating people over the head. Absolutely. But Absolutely. sometimes it just it's just hard, man. You're, you're taking away their livelihood. Absolutely. And, and it, it's difficult. Yeah. And back then, you know, we didn't make life changing money like some of these guys make now. So when you got let go by the Phillies, you immediately started thinking of my next job to survive. Oh, well, how did the boss? How did the Boston thing pop up? How when was that? Did you have a year coaching, and then the Boston thing came about? You know, it, I went to uh, I went to Oakland in '03, and I remember Billy Bean telling me, and I was only kind of half listening. He goes, Tito, he goes, if we do well, you'll get another job. And Manager's I even, job? Yeah, and I was like, I didn't even know if I wanted to because yeah, you know the Philly know. thing was so hard. I know. And when you know when you get beat up, you're like, man, I, I love the game, but I don't know if I really want to do that again. And we had a good year in in Oakland, and 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 I Ken Maka was the manager, and he let me do a lot, and and it was good for me. And also, this was the beginning of of Moneyball, was, yes, and and the analytics, and it was kind of eye opening for me. And and then I interviewed in Boston you know, that, that winter and things took off from there. And, you know, I, I know how fortunate I am because there's so many guys just like me that get one chance. Yeah. And I was very fortunate in not only getting a second chance, but going to a team that was ready to win. Yeah. But who was in that room? Must've been a tough room. If Larry Lakino was in there with Theo. <laughs> Larry, Larry didn't do much in the interview process, but he certainly did in the negotiating for a contract, which as you know, Larry, as well as I do, there is no negotiating. No. Larry, Larry's favorite word in, in the whole English language is leverage. And he had it. <laughs> so you go in there and it's 2004 and you get to the postseason. Now, correct me if I'm right. That's the year you won the, the world series. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, after 86 years, you probably had some 90-year-old New England women chasing you around want to make out with you. So. I'll tell you what, Eddie, when we were down 3-0 to the Yankees, I had some people chasing me. Not, <laughs> you know, it's probably fitting that, you know, after all the close calls they had and all the things that happened, to win it the way we won it, you know, after kind of looking like we were down and out was probably kind of fitting. 
And it it was, I mean, those were the, the, the four games against the Yankees were probably the four funnest baseball days of my life. After you were down 3-0. After. <laughs> yeah. So you go in and you sweep the World Series. What was that like when, uh, I think it was a comebacker to your closer. Was Keith that the, Folk. Uh, Keith Folk. And the first baseman kept the ball and started a comeback. Yeah, yeah. There's always, there's that, always something going like on in Boston. It was on the road, too. So I can remember, Eddie, in uh, Game 7 in New York, our bullpen was fried. I mean, our guys were fried. <laughs> and I brought in Pedro in the eighth inning because the only guy that was fresh behind him was Bronson Arroyo. And I remember thinking if I bring in Bronson and he struggles, we, we don't really have, we're, you know, we're, we're out of gas. And when I brought him in, Yankee stadium was going crazy. They're like you Pedro in. Yeah. You know, it's a year after whatever happened. Oh, the year yeah. before and, Oh, and they're, you know, they're screaming, who's your daddy? And, <laughs> you know, and, and, and Millsy looked at me, you know, Brad Mills, my longtime sure. bench coach and best friend. And he goes, he looked at me and I said, Millsy, I just wanted to, just wanted to give these people a little something to yell about. And he goes, well, you certainly succeeded. <laughs> 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 so after the last out of the World Series in St. Louis, what was that like the next couple of hours? Must have been just. You know what's funny, Eddie, is for me, the fun was getting there. Like, I love the journey. Um, about an hour after it was over, it's like, okay, what's next? And it wasn't <laughs> that I didn't care. I just like, you know, like, okay, that was cool. But like, I, I loved being a part of it. And, 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 and to this day, I, I've always felt the same way. Like when we clinch something, I'll go in and watch the players and really enjoy it. But then I'll just sneak away and, you know, maybe go have a cigar and kind of get quiet and think like, okay, what do we do next? And it's just the way I've always been. Yeah. There must be something when you get in there and you say, well, there's nothing left to do. Next. <laughs> yeah. You know? But then you, then you go to the world series again, win again in another sweep. And then, um, and I'll tell you what. I was, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. The team, I thought the team in 08 was our best team yet. And Tampa beat us. And, and you know, some things stick with you. And that one stuck with me for a long time because I thought that maybe had been was our best team. And they beat us in seven games. And, and that one stung. Yeah, I bet. You know, it happens that way. I thought the 88 Mets were better than the 86 Mets, and they got beat by the Dodgers. And so that happened. So your time from with Boston, I know I, I hate – if you don't want to talk about this, that's no, fine. No, we, that, that we talk about chicken, anything. Chicken and beer thing, whatever, in Boston. Um, if, know, they, if they – People lost their jobs because of chicken and beer. We'd had nobody else to play this game over the last hundred years. <laughs> you know, I think it became sort of a metaphor for maybe just us not paying attention to detail. Because yeah. like you say, I've been in every major league clubhouse in this country and there's chicken and beer in every clubhouse. And there's probably worse than that. Yeah. But in Boston, when you collapse like we did, somebody has to pay the price. And I was there long enough to know that. Yeah. And I I wouldn't have scripted it the way it ended, but it sometimes those things happen. Very seldom are you able to write your own script. And that's Absolutely. why I was so grateful this past year when I when I stepped down that I did it on my own terms. And Absolutely. it felt good. And I was really, really happy that I was allowed to do that. Uh, that's very rarely do people get a chance to do that. <clears throat> and uh, last thing, Cleveland. Now, when you when you got let go by Boston, you're probably thinking, well, you know, I had a good run. I won two World Series. I'm feeling good about myself. You know, I can go play some golf and maybe be an advisor to player development or something. And then who called you from Cleveland? Well, it goes, you know, I, I was so burned out. I mean, eight years there. As you know, man, that they should oh. measure those in dog years. I know. There are the two places you're coming from, Philadelphia and Boston. I, I mean, know. 
My next stop should have been, my next stop should have been Beirut. But, <laughs> so but you like, can relax a little bit. <laughs> but I uh, I took a job with ESPN, and it ended up being really really good. They treated me like gold, and and I got to watch baseball, which I love, without the emotion of a win or a loss hanging over exactly. your head. Yes. And it wasn't until about it was probably about the end of August that I actually started to miss it a little bit. Yeah. And I, I admit up to that point, man, I was, I was just okay doing what I was doing. Yeah. It and takes time. Right, this, it takes time. I mean, you get burned out, you get bitter, you know, you're pissed yeah. off. There's, I thought you were treated horribly by the Red Sox when you left. But and it's it time it, to get over that. It, it, it does. It really does. And, and if you're going to be a, a manager, not only going to be a manager, but going to be the man, manage the way you're supposed to, Having those feelings isn't conducive to to being a good manager. So right. stepping away was really good, and and I I think when I came back, I was better prepared to be patient and do some of the things you need to do as a manager. But that year was was really important to me. Yeah, I mean, you're coming from you know huge market clubs, huge revenues, big time spending clubs, and now you go into Cleveland. And what was that? What was your first team like there? I mean, you didn't have the the big, uh, you know, number one starter or the, you know, the perennial MVP candidate there. What was that like? Well, you know, before I before I even took the job, Mark Shapiro and Chris Antonetti, they sat me down. And I mean, they they almost tried to talk me out of the job. <laughs> I mean, I give them credit like they they said, Tito, here's how it is. This is our payroll. In 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 April, there might be three or four thousand people at the game. They said, you know, they just didn't want me to get there. You know how it is. You sure. can talk any job into being good when you're excited. Oh, yeah. And they just didn't want me to get there and regret it. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. In fact, that's one of the things. You know, Mark left after a couple of years and went to Toronto, but Chris and Cherney they always talked to me about the direction we were going and it helped me because sometimes it was kind of challenging. You know, it's like, sure. Hey, we're going to, we're going to drop our, our salary. We got to get down to this amount. And, you know, it, you know, but they would talk me through it and it helped me. Cause then I could talk to the coaches and we could sure. kind of make sure the players understood. Yeah, they make you part of the process. that they're all uh, they, they were, they were terrific. And, and they were from day one. It, 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 it really helped me. I, I tell people, they, they're, the, they're the nicest people in the world. And on challenging days, that kind of wins out. Absolutely. So your 11 years in Cleveland, the highlights, well, one of them's got to be the 16 World Series. That that was a, a high and then a low and then an unforgettable thing. But you know what? And, and you don't know how your emotions are ever going to be because that's why they're emotions. But pride won out over being disappointed. I mean, naturally wanted to get that last win somehow. Yes. But I was so proud because we were so beat up and guys were pitching on short rest and shoot Andrew Miller. I don't know how he could pick up his arm, you know, after that for, I mean, we just guys were to see the way they competed. I was so proud of them. Actually the next year in 17, when we were up 2-0 to the Yankees, and then they came back and, and beat us. That stayed with me for a long, long time just because I didn't think we put our best foot forward. And it, it really ate at me for a long time. In fact, it still does. I bet. But, and it just, like I said, you can't figure how your emotions are going to be. That's why they're emotions. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when I saw you in August when you came in here and, and uh, you didn't tell me you were done, but – you said your concern was, um, what am I going to do all day? I mean, you haven't gone through it yet, right? You haven't gone through it yet. When spring training starts, you're going to be a little like, and I think I told you something like, hey, you get up in the morning, you have a nice breakfast, you go for a walk, you go to the gym, you have lunch, you take a nap, and it's happy hour. Day's over. <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny all day to do nothing. <laughs> it's funny you say that because everybody's asked me, "Hey, how's retirement?" Well, it's no different yet because yes, this it's is not different yet. Yeah, 
And I know that when spring training rolls around, I'd be crazy if I didn't feel something. Yeah, of course. But but you know what, Eddie? I thought it through pretty good. And and last year, around June, I was really struggling. Like, hey, do I want to do this? And I was kind of getting mad at myself. I'm like, hey, man, either you're in or out, man. Like, you know, this isn't right. fair to anybody. And then the day I finally sat and talked to Chris and Cherney was probably the middle of August. And I told him, I said, guys, I think I'm running out of gas. And, and I said, look, I said, I'm telling you this now because you've been so good to me, go find the next guy and don't tiptoe around me. You guys have been so good to me. I just want you to have the a chance to go find the next guy. And, and so it, it was, it wasn't like, like they were firing me or, you know, they were going behind sure. my back. We yeah. were in it together. And, and you went and, out on your own terms. And it, very rarely can you do that in our game. And for that, I'm really grateful. Uh, any concerns about where we're heading as an industry going forward? I'll tell you one of my concerns is a starting pitching function. Um, you know, when you have, you don't have one team in the big leagues that's averaged six innings per start in their staff. The leaders, there's four clubs that are five and two thirds. There's nine clubs that did not get five innings per start from their starting pitchers. And I see young managers come in and, you know, when you've got four innings of bullpen every night, plus you're managing in May, like it's the fourth game of the ALCS. I mean, what do you think it's going to look like in August and September? I mean, Dallas Green always told me once the season starts and you have those starting pitchers, you know, you go five, your first start, seven, your second, then here we go, you know. You've got to abuse, you got to absorb some abuse. If you're up nine to one in the sixth inning and there's bases loaded, nobody out, don't be looking in that bullpen. We need you to finish this game. And you win it nine to four and you give the bullpen a day off. I never see that happening anymore. The first chance they get that guy out of the game, he's out. You know, and some of it is is strategic, which, you know, because analytics are such a big part of our game now. Yeah. I think some of it is the kids coming up to the major leagues they're not prepared to, to do what, you know, and the rigors. And I think when they come to the major leagues, it's the biggest step. Anyway, the intensity ratchets, oh it ratchets God. up. Yeah. And so when you're asking them to do something they haven't done before at the major league level, yes. then you are going to f- run into troubles. I, I agree with you. You know, Ed, I'll take it a step further. Um, when we get to the playoffs, everybody's clamoring for, they want to see action. They want to see runs. You don't really find out who the best team is because there's so many days off. If they could play like the regular season, you know, play, play a best of seven with one day off where every team had to use their entire roster like they did during the year, I think you would see the best team win. Yes. Instead of who has the best two pitchers yes. and with days off, we can stay away from our three, four and five. Yes. Or and that's in on the, on the conversely, that's why you see a team like the Marlins win two world series with no division titles. And the Braves win one world series with 13 division titles. They clinch early. They try to rest people. That wild card team, man, every day is just another big game. So you wake up on Monday, big game, Tuesday, Wednesday, first day of the playoffs, doesn't matter. It's just like last week. So I don't think yeah, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. It's for people way above our pay grade, but uh you know, it's a great game. I'll tell you what, the 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 pitch clock to me, I call it the uh uh the game clock, whatever. Um the it changed the game. I mean, to me as a fan, the games at the end of two years ago before the clock were becoming unwatchable. And the amount of time it took off the time of games, it went from over three hours to 239. So unfortunately, we have to do things like that to to help the game move forward. Yeah. And, and, you know, we sat in that meeting uh, in the winter meetings. They were talking about the pitch clock. And I thought my head was going to explode. And I was panicked because I had done something one way for 22 years. Sure. And they assured me, they were like, Tito, the first week, your head is going to explode the second week. It'll be a little better. The third. And you know what? They were right. And I think it lent itself to 
being a better game or back to being the game that we kind of were used to before. Absolutely. And I, I do think it's healthy for the game. I do too. And no one's added to the health of this game more than you have, Tito. And uh, it's an honor for me to be your friend. I don't want to embarrass you, but I've spoken with several people who are involved with the Hall of Fame, and it looks like you're going to be a Hall of Fame manager, um, mm -hmm. justifiably so. So I can't thank you enough for coming on today, Tito. Eddie, you know what? One of the coolest things, and one of the things I'll brag about, is I've been around more good people in this game than anybody. And that's what's so special about our okay. game. And that's this is right. the stuff here, like, I mean, you know, we were teammates in '86. You know, right. I mean, that come on, man. That, but, but, and when you you just pick up right where you left off, that's the beauty of our game, and that's what I'll miss are Absolutely. the people because it it's the greatest in the world. Well, the game's gonna miss you too, Terry. Thanks, Eddie. All right, thank you. All right, man.